and welcome to the United Church of Asonid on this gorgeous September morn. Um, our meditation, <clears throat> beautiful Savior, please help me keep my eyes on you and not on my problems. You're always faithful. Please join me in the call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell him the wondrous works. Glory in his name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he has uttered. O oh, offspring of Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Then Israel came to Egypt. Jacob lived as an alien in the land of Ham. And the Lord made his people very fruitful and made them stronger foes whose hearts he then turned to hate his people, to deal craftily with his servants. He sent his servant Moses and Aaron, whom he had chosen, that they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. Our opening hymn is in the Red Pilgrim Hymnal on page 428 when Israel was in Egypt's land. Please stand if you are able. Born a 
Join me in the invocation and Lord's Prayer found in your bulletin. Eternal God, when we search for you, we find you. When we seek you, we find you seeking us. Your presence among us changes our circumstances and our lives. We honor and worship you as an act of devotion and discipleship. Infuse us with your spirit that our witness and ministry may be a testimony to your everlasting love. We pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen glory be to the father and to the son and to may be seated. The announcements are on the back of your bill bulletin. Um, the flowers this morning are from myself, um, welcoming in fall. And please sign up for hosting a coffee hour if you wish on the sign up sheet that is down in Fellowship Hall. And then the Bible book study will be starting Tuesday, September 5th at 7 p.m. in Fellowship Hall. And you'll be looking at Psalms as expression of the deepest cries of our hearts and as models of prayer. All are invited. The deacons will be meeting next Sunday, September 10th, after church in Fellowship Hall. And then Rally Sunday will be on September 17th after church in Fellowship Hall and it will be hosted by the deacons. So we will welcome everybody back to the fall and also everybody can enjoy a Sunday. We are collecting food for the pantry in Freetown in Berkeley and if you would like to donate, the boxes are in the narthex. If you have any suggestions or concerns, please speak to a member of the Pastoral Advisory Committee. And Reverend Baker's blog can be found on his website that is listed. And Reverend Baker is available in his office on Fridays for anyone who wishes to see him. Please contact him with your request. Does anyone have any other announcements?
So I have a few uh, more uh, things I want to say. Um, first is, I wanted to remind you that we're going to be hosting uh, that um, association meeting on Tuesday, October 17th. And one of the things we're doing in preparation for that meeting is we're collecting socks. So I wanted to remind you, uh, put forward a nice red bin here for the socks, red for red socks. Okay, it's easy way to remember. So put those down there and I want you to be as uh, welcoming and as generous as you can be. Uh, hopefully we'll have a good turnout. Hopefully we'll have a, a better, uh, better path towards competition than the Red Sox did this year. So that's always a good thing. Um, Kathy and I made some nice posters for um, the uh, study on the Psalms, which will begin on uh, Tuesday. So um, if you see these, great. And if you'd like a copy to distribute or put up somewhere, just let me know. Uh, tell people about it. And speaking of telling people about things, make sure you reach out to your friends and to, uh, again, people in the church who um, may not be coming, haven't come for a while. Uh, speaking directly with people works better than throwing something up on Facebook. That's important too, but it's that one-on-one -on -one, um, communication that always works best. If there are no other announcements uh, this morning, and I did have a lot of uh, <clears throat> things to say in the newsletter, and let me know if you did not receive the newsletter, then let us now move on to our time of joy and concern. We have our continued prayers today for Leon Cudworth Sr., for Anne Marie Allen, for Dick Field, for, um, for uh, Tiffany, and for Kim Vonica, for Susan Lemos, uh, for Eunice, for Mary and for Millie Moore, for Pat Gonsalves and for Nick Riccardi, for Bethany Costa, for Bobby Files, for Pat Ribello, for Franklin McMullen, and for David Brzezuski. Are there any other prayer requests this morning? Yes, Mary. The Cheney? Yeah, the Cheney? Well, the Cheney family. The Cheney family, okay. Yeah. Um, also, the Anthony's family, he's got a Nobios last Saturday as well. Mm -hmm. So, his family. And my Shabazz, they had a child, he's married, has, they had no child, she's pregnant. She couldn't breastfeed. She was a doctor, she had stage 4 breast cancer. She just passed last week, and so now he has a whole little bit of people. So yeah. Ryan's last family, and then this family. And, yeah, and that's Ryan, what, say the name, Tavares. what? Ryan Tavares. Ryan Tavares, yeah. So again, a lot of uh, hard, a lot of hard uh, deaths. Uh, in from uh, suicide, from overdose, from cancer. So our prayers are with uh, the families, with the Cheneys and with uh, Tavares's and with Anthony's family that uh, they may find uh, peace uh, and solace in their losses. Any other prayer requests this morning? Let us, let us be together in a spirit of prayer. O oh God, you who are the great I am, make yourself known to us today. Help us praise you as we say thanksgiving for your many blessings, including forgiveness for all the ways we fall short. Guide us through our journeys. You know our suffering and our stress. Deliver us. Hear our cry for those who have suffered in the wake of Hurricane Idalia. For those who have already been affected by that and so many storms, hear our plea for relief for those in other parts of our country and world who have been experiencing fires, droughts, and other disasters. Hear our prayer for those who have faced devastation and loss of life. 
Hear our requests for liberation for those who are oppressed, under attack, held captive, or in fear for their lives or well-being. God of our ancestors, we pray for healing and rehabilitation for those in our midst who are ill, facing surgeries, or recovering from surgeries. We pray for strength and courage and comfort for those facing death and those who have had loved ones die. We pray especially for Leon and for Anne-Marie and for Dick and for Tiff and for Kim and for Susan and Eunice, for Mary and Millie, for Pat and for Nick, for Bethany and Bobby, for Tony and Franklin and David, for the Cheney family, for the Devaris family, for Anthony's family, for all those who need your healing power. Hear now the silent prayers of our hearts as we listen to your word for us. Lord of all, transform us. Show us love, hope, patience, perseverance, welcome, grace, and joy. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're having the, the day's the last weekend, unofficial weekend in summer. And one of the things my wife likes to do is go to the beach. And I'm not the biggest beach guy in the world. I don't like being hot. I don't like being wet. I don't like being around other people. So you can see the beach may not be my favorite place. But one of the things I like to do uh, when things are a little more unquiet is I wear my shoes when I go to the beach. And one of the reasons I do this is I don't want my feet touching the sand. It feels weird to me. I'm kind of, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sensitive about my feet. It's one of the reasons I don't want to have foot washing on Maundy Thursday. But there are places where you are supposed to take off your shoes, and I guess the beach is one of them. But going into places that are considered holy is another. We're going to hear in our story from Exodus today how when uh, Moses heard the voice of God and saw the burning bush, the voice told him to take off his sandals for this was holy ground. And I've been to many religious communities. I've been to um, Muslim communities and Hindu communities where you are supposed to take off your shoes when you go into the worship. They have little cubbies for everyone to put their shoes in when you arrive. Um, and that's a sign of respect. Uh, it's a sign of uh, accepting their hospitality to do things you may not always feel comfortable uh, doing. It's a, uh, it's a way of, of showing vulnerability uh, before God and before uh, your neighbors because your shoes are there to protect your feet so they don't get worn out, damaged, dirty. And so the ability to take off your shoes to open yourself and be vulnerable to other people in faith I think can be a really important thing so I want you to keep in mind that when we come into church we may be a little more on the casual side uh, we certainly don't take off our shoes even though we have a nice carpet but uh, it is important to remember that when we do come into our church we do leave things behind and we do open ourselves to the vulnerability of being in the presence of God and being in the presence of our friends and neighbors and not just closing ourselves off because it feels more comfortable that way so I ask you now to pray with me God help us to be vulnerable before you and others help us to accept hospitality to expect 
and give it to others. Amen. So it's time for our offering. Uh, we're going to be taking that collection for the Hawaii uh, conference to help with the damage from the uh, wildfires uh, today. Um, so after, um, so as the uh, offering happens, Susan will be taking the regular collection. And uh, Jeff, are you gonna, okay. Will you be able to take the, uh, the special collection for us? I appreciate that very much. Right. So Jesus posed the question. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world and forfeit their life? And so when we consider the gifts we give and receive, we remember that the Creator is also the source. So let us give generously of the abundance of our lives so that the world may be made better and God's kingdom may come nearer. This morning's offerings will now be received. Generous God, thank you for the seeding and inspiring generosity in us. May these gifts be a blessing to the ministry of this church. Multiply them and make us fruitful and faithful stewards of our time, talent, and treasure. Amen. Thank you very much. Our hymn of preparation this morning is from the Red Pilgrim Hymnal. It is number 247. Holy God, we praise thy name. Uh, though, let us all sing together. <laughs> No. 
The scriptures this morning, the Old Testament lesson is from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15, and can be found in your Pew Bible on page 45 to 46. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Persezites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, 
Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. The Gospel lesson according to Matthew is from chapter 16 verses 21 to 28 and can be found on page 717 in your pew Bible. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming into his kingdom. Here endeth the reading. Good morning, everybody. How's everyone feeling today? Good. Feeling good, excellent. It's a beautiful day to feel good on. <clears throat> Last week was my son Finn's first week of classes in college, and one of the classes that he's taking, and I had no input on what classes he was going to take, but one of the classes he's taking is on genocide studies, which apparently is a specialty of his university. He spent, so he went to the first day of classes, and he was a little disappointed in the class because the professor spent the whole time trying to define what genocide meant. And of course, if you know anything about uh, this kind of stuff, it's a very difficult and a very controversial question. But Finn didn't have much patience for this conversation. He said, shouldn't we be focused on solutions? Why are we wasting time on all this minutia? And I said, welcome to college. You know, and I indicated that much of academic work is based around asking the right questions rather than finding solutions. Because without those questions, without that analysis, without that minutia, you end up getting solutions that fail to see the big picture and often don't work. So an important starting point to any question that you might have, any problem you might be seeking a solution for is trying to define your terms, deciding what names you're going to give to things. In some ways, you need to check an idea's ID to see what it really means. Now, people have long understood how important names are. In many cultures, people have different names at different ages, and some have a secret name that's only to those initiated into a certain group. 
Uh, one story you might know about how powerful names are, if you're not intimately familiar with, say, Roman nomenclature, is the story of Rumpelstiltskin. Everyone know that story? Is there anyone who does not know the story of Rumpelstiltskin? Okay, good. I don't have to tell it. So, just to remind you, Rumpelstiltskin is that imp who uh, spins straw into gold for this girl, and then he, when the girl uh, is successful, he takes her firstborn child as payment for the work. And the only way to get the child back and to break the power is to discover and then say his secret name, which is, of course, Rumpelstiltskin. So this, this is an uh, old folkloric way of remembering how important names are. Because if someone tells you their true and their secret name, it is a sign of intimacy and it can be the foundation of special and deep relationships. Our lesson today uh, from Exodus, uh, we heard the story of the burning bush and Moses' first encounter with God. Everybody know this story? All right. Better or worse than Rumpelstiltskin? All right. Now, there's a lot going on in this story. Uh, from there's the bush that glows with fire, but it's not consumed. There's the importance of holy spaces. But what I want to talk about today is how names are used in this story. Once Moses has removed his sandals, God says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now these are the names that God wants Moses to know. They point to the past, to the marvelous things that God has done. But this name is in some ways limiting. Because this God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, was a God who helped a family and not a world. And it was a name that's more about what God did than about who God was. It was more of an outer show than a sign of, of the truth of God. Now, God points out these past gifts, because God is about to reveal to Moses the greatest gift yet, which is freeing the Israelites from slavery and bringing them into a promised land, flowing with milk and honey. But as God is telling Moses about his mission to confront the Pharaoh, who, notice, is not named in this story, Moses asks God a question. He says, excuse me, if I come to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Now Moses could have just said that the God was the God of his ancestors. But for a people who had only known slavery, all those past promises seemed far away and long ago and had nothing to do with their lives. Who cared what happened to Abraham hundreds of years ago? They needed to know who God truly was. What was God's name? How could they tie into the power of the true name? And so God says, I am who I am. That is the name of God. Now Hebrew, the Hebrew here can be, uh, is a little difficult and it can be translated in some different ways. It can also be translated as, I am what I am, or I will be what I will be, or even perhaps, I will be who I have been. The verb to be can be tricky, whether it's in English or Hebrew or pretty much every language. This name, I am who I am, implies that God is not just something that happened in the past, but it's part of all time and all being. God's truest name is above all things, all conception. The God, I am who I am, is the God of everything. And then God gives a special version of the name, I am who I am, which is also based on the verb to be. Now you've probably heard this name before, but I'm not going to speak it here because in Jewish tradition, the name is so special, so intimate, and so powerful that to speak it casually, even in worship, 
is a violation of that relationship. This is what the third commandment is talking about when it says you shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't swear. This holiest of names is spelled out yod He wah He in Hebrew. But out of respect, the word is always pronounced Adonai when you come across it in a Hebrew service, which means the Lord or my God, my Lord, the Lord or my Lord. So God then says to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent you, and thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. The name our English translations, you translate as the Lord, which we see all the time, and here all the time is that as a translation of that special secret name. And so here, God reiterates all the names that we've heard about so far. I am, the highest form of being, God of the ancestors, the one who is faithful in the past, and the Lord, that special name, which will mark Israel as a chosen people because they know it. Now, all of these names describe God. And so whenever we use any of these names, we mean all of those things, all at the same time. Now, while the name Adonai uh, comes from tradition, it's not actually in the Bible, um, I still find it interesting because it implies both power in the word Lord, but also intimacy, the implied my at the end. Because God is all-powerful, but God is still immediate and present. God is above all things, but God laughs with us. God cries with us. When we pray, when we mean all of these things, when we say that little three-letter word, God. There are other names for God, other metaphors for God. Our gospel lesson is a continuation of last week's story where Peter was praised for calling Jesus the Messiah. Messiah is a Jewish word, which in Greek is translated as Christ. So when we say Jesus Christ, we mean Jesus the Messiah. In Hebrew, Messiah means anointed one. And by Jesus' times, it had make it on a, it'd take it on a very specific meaning of a prophesied king and priest who would restore the fortunes of the Jews, much like God had done with the Israelites and Moses in, in the Exodus story. But when Peter uses the term Messiah to say who Christ, God, who Jesus is, he says, you are the Messiah. That name, that idea of Messiah has a lot of baggage because it had accumulated a, a certain type of expectation, not just of spiritual salvation, but of political salvation, a return to power and militarily driving one's enemies away. And so in Peter's mind, to be the Messiah is to be invincible. That's what Messiah means to Peter. It means invincible. And so when Jesus then began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised, Peter was mortified. The Messiah does not suffer, he thought. The Messiah is not killed. The Messiah does not need to be raised from the dead. And so Peter, knowing what the name Messiah means, tells Jesus he must be wrong and assumes that maybe Jesus is feeling some self-doubt. He's being a little self-deprecating. And so Peter says, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. And now it's Jesus' turn to be a little upset and to use some powerful names. He says, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. That word hindrance can also mean stumbling block. So a few minutes earlier, Peter was the rock upon whom the church would be built, and now he's the stumbling block, keeping Jesus from being who Jesus needs to be. 
the same man was the one who a few minutes ago held the keys of heaven and earth it is now called by the name of the great adversary and destroyer of humanity so Peter has taken that name of the Messiah and pulled it down to earth and to earthly expectations he's tried to rob it of its true power the power of that name Jesus says that the name Messiah is more than what Peter and other people imagine. And it's not bound by space or time or suffering, just as the name I am who I am is beyond these things. Getting the name of the Messiah right is important because it allows Jesus' disciples to understand the true meaning of the cross and the suffering that they will face in their lives. They must see things not around the earthly ways of power and vengeance, but in heavenly ways of peace and understanding. And thus Jesus says, for those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The names we use for things matter. Whether those are the names for genocide, the Messiah, or our, our, our Almighty God. When you pray to God, or you sing the name of God in the hymns we sing, or the, maybe the music you hear is your, about your day, what does that name, God, mean to you? You're, you've heard me blabbing about Hebrew for the last 10 minutes. What does the name God mean to you? What images does it conjure up in your mind? Is it the God of unfathomable fathomable being? Is it the God of history and kept promises? The God who rules over all? The God who loves you? The God of your most private and innermost being? The God who knows your true and secret name? Those three letters carry a lot of weight. And it's important to carry all that meaning when we say the word God because those words, those ideas can be misused. They can be misunderstood. The God of creation can become a distant God you can ignore. The God of power is a God that you think is telling you how to control other people. The God of history becomes a God that only cares about what happens in the world, and the private God becomes a God who only cares what happens to your inner soul. These are dangerous gods. They are gods that hurt people, and they pull us away from what our true God wants us to do. So let's take a moment. We hear all these fans blowing. Right? Feel the wind coming from different directions. Let's take a moment and let's whisper the name God to ourselves. God. What was the first thing that popped into your mind when you said that word God? Does anybody want to share? What? Agape. Agape. Love. Yeah? God is with me all the time. Yeah? Same idea? His presence is knowing. Other things you felt, you, un you popped into your head when you heard God. When I said the word God just now, I felt a call. I felt supported and, and held up like there was a foundation that I could use to run on. That was what popped into my head when I said the word God just now. So we've heard all these different ways of how different people at different times, because if I say it in five minutes, it's going to feel like something different. How important it is to get all of those senses of who God is when we pray. So I want you to keep working on understanding that name. I want you to keep questioning what it means and why it means and never think that you have found the answer. 
Because once you stop asking those questions, once you stop looking for the questions, you tend to get those rotten solutions, right? So I want you to pray in the name of God today and always. And with that in mind, let us all pray. Dear God, you are everything. You mean everything, and you mean everything to us. Help us to know you more every day. And in your most holy name, we pray. Amen. Our communion hymn this morning comes again from our Red Pilgrim hymnal. It is number 287. Here, O my Lord, I see thee face to face. Please rise if you are able and if you are comfortable, and let us all sing together.
Let us give thanks to God, for it is right to give God thanks and praise. Let us pray. We give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for calling forth the creation, bridging us from dust by the breath of your being. We bless you for the beauty and bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day, but sharing by all will mean scarcity for nothing. We remember the covenant you made with your people Israel and we give you thanks for all our ancestors in faith. We rejoice that you call us to reconciliation with you and all people everywhere that you remain faithful to your covenants, even when we are faithless. We rejoice that you call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and victory. We have a remembrance and celebration of the gift of Jesus Christ whom you sent the fullness of time to be the good news. Born of Mary, our sister in faith, Christ lived among us to reveal the mystery of your word, to suffer and die on the cross for us, to be raised from death on the third day, and then to live in glory. We bless you, gracious God, in the presence of your Holy Spirit in the church who have gathered. With your sons and daughters in faith in all times and places, we praise you with joy. Singing, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the heights. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the heights. And so it is that we remember. But on the night of the trail and desertion, Jesus took the bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance. Thus we are bold to pray in the mystery of our faith. Christ has not. Christ is risen. And Christ will come again. Eternal God, we spread your table with these gifts of the earth and of our labor. We present to you our very lives, committed to your service in behalf of all people. We ask you to save your Holy Spirit on this bread, this cup, on our gifts and on us. Strengthen your universal church that it may be champion of peace and justice in all the world. Restore the earth with your grace that is able to make all things new. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. the broken bread and participate in the body.
body of Christ, take and be. Through the cup of blessing, you participate in the new life of Christ.
that serve as beacons of hope, compassion, possibility as we go with God on the journey of truth. Amen. Thank you.